I'd like to thank Aurora Scientific for giving me this opportunity to present my research. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the importance of muscle UOK2 and the role that it plays in skeletal muscle homeostasis and function via its critical role in turnover of ubiquinated protein aggregates. Maintenance of skeletal muscle mass and function throughout the lifespan contribute to independence, decreased mortality, and a greater quality of life in the elderly. Furthermore, skeletal muscle is also an important metabolic organ that contributes largely to metabolism. It is a major utilizer of glucose in response to insulin and exercise and plays a critical role in whole body insulin sensitivity. Proper protein turnover is essential in maintenance of muscle mass and function. There are many myopathies and metabolic diseases where protein turnover is impaired, which contributes to the muscle loss and dysfunction. However, the molecular mechanisms regulating this process need to be further understood. Autophagy is a primary means of degrading large and aggregate proteins. If left unchecked, these aggregate proteins can create a toxic environment for the cell. In short, autophagy operates by forming a double membrane vesicle called the autophagosome, which you can see here in the, the image depicted. This, is then, this then encapsulates the cargo to be degraded. The autophagosome then fuses with the lysosome and the contents of the lysosome degrade the autophagic cargo into their basic biological units, which can be utilized as fuel or other basic building blocks to maintain cellular function. It is important to point out a few critical players here uh, in the autophagy process and their precise role. LC31 is shown in the green dot here, is converted to LC32 in order to facilitate the formation of the or the initiation of the autophagosome. Without the conversion of LC31 to LC32, the autophagosome is unable to form and autophagy is halted. Ubiquitin tags the cargo, such as aggregate proteins, to be degraded. Autophagy adapters such as P62 and MBR1, which are depicted as the red squares there, uh, recognize the polyubiquitin chain on the cargo and bind to it. The adapter proteins serve as a bridge that link ubiquinated cargo to the forming autophagosome. Specifically, P62 and MBR1 link the ubiquinated cargo to LC32. As the autophagosome membrane forms, it encapsulates the ubiquinated cargo inside. The cargo is then degraded and broken down upon lysosomal fusion. In order to understand the role that autophagy plays in skeletal muscle, health and aggregate protein turnover, we took an unbiased approach by first looking at 34 putative or established autophagy genes and their expression in skeletal muscle. Out of those 34 genes, we identified seven to be expressed at twofold or higher expression in skeletal muscle when compared to 90 other tissues or cell lines, with UOK2 being the second most highly expressed. Next, we examined if any of those same 34 putative autophagy genes correlated with the expression of three skeletal muscle specific genes that have distinct functions in skeletal muscle and found the UOK2 to be the only one strongly correlated with them at an R value of 0.5 or higher. Lastly, we looked at mRNA transcripts of cost tissues with, whose expression was highly correlated with UOK2 and identified the 10 the top 10 gene ontology enrichment categories. All 10 of these categories were associated with skeletal muscle. Um, ULK2 has a better known paralog, ULK1, uh, that is well established with its role in autophagy. We compared mRNA copy number of ULK1 and ULK2 and found that ULK2 is much more highly expressed in skeletal muscle. Looking at this data, we concluded that ULK2 follows a genetic, a genetic pattern of expression related to skeletal muscle, and that skeletal muscle is particularly enriched with, skeletal, with UOK2. This suggests to us that UOK2 likely plays an important role in protein turnover in the muscle, and we want to further investigate that. Uh, to do that, to understand the role, precise role of UOK1 and UOK2 in skeletal muscle, we designed a model where we could electroporate the tibialis anterior of the mouse with a plasmid encoding for a microRNA for either UOK2 or UOK1. One mouse would receive either the plasmid encoding the microRNA for UOK2 or UOK1 in one leg, and the non-targeting plasmid encoding the microRNA in the other leg. This is important because we had to control, we had the same, we had the control within the same mouse. One leg would be the muscle that is deficient of UOK1 or UOK2, with the other serving as control. This helps this strengthened the model. Uh, with 
With that, we let it set for seven days and then harvested the tissue where we then proceeded to perform histochemical and biochemical analysis. Something I didn't mention earlier is that the microRNAs were linked with green fluorescent protein or GFP. That way we could track which muscle fibers were actually electroporated. The image here on the right is a representative image depicting of what those muscles would look like under a microscope. To first examine, you know, was the model effective? Were the plasmids encoding those microRNAs effective at knocking down UOK1 and 2? Uh, we looked at the respective gene expression and it was effective. They were both effective at knocking that down. Um, and importantly to know is that fasting or starvation induces autophagy. And we wanted to examine the role that these two proteins played under a basal level of autophagy, so under occurring at normal conditions and a starvation-induced autophagy. So upon 48 hours of starvation, mice lost about 20% of body mass and had a reduction in myofiber size. However, the absence of UOK2 or UOK1 did not protect against starvation-induced atrophy at 48 hours, demonstrating that UOK2 or UOK1 or, and UOK1 are dispensable for starvation-induced atrophy in muscle. Next, we wanted to understand how autophagy is being affected at those critical steps in the absence of UOK1 or 2. As I mentioned earlier, LC3 1 to 2 conversion is essential for initiation of autophagy. In UOK2 deficient muscle, LC3 1 to 2 conversion is unaffected, as you can see by these uh, representative Western blots here. However, there is a slight impairment in LC3 1 to 2 conversion in the UOK1 deficient muscle. The most important and robust finding, however, is uh, the finding that P62, MBR1, and ubiquitin, which tag the cargo to be degraded and aid in them being brought into the formula autophagosome, all accumulate under basal and starvation conditions in ULK2 deficient muscle. This suggests that ULK2 plays an important role in this aspect. From there, we wanted to further tease out what was occurring at the different steps of autophagy and whether autophagic flux impairment was responsible for the accumulation of these autophagy adapters and ubiquitinated proteins. One way to test this is by administering colchicine to the mice. Colchicine is a microtubular depolymerizing agent that blocks lysosomal fusion to the autophagosome. As autophagy is a multi-step process, it will occur naturally up to this point um, LC3 will be converted to LC32, and the autophagosome will form. Cargo will be incorporated into the formula autophagosome. However, the lysosome will not fuse, and the cargo rem will remain inside the autophagosome, unable to be degraded. Uh, LC3, which decorates LC32, sorry, excuse me, uh, which decorates the inside of the autophagosome, will also accumulate in this process. If administration of colchicine indeed works, there will be an accumulation of LC32 which is what you can clearly see happens in the colchicine positive lanes. This demonstrates that our colchicine administration was effective at blocking lysosomal fusion. However, there is no difference in LC3 2 to 1 ratios in the ULK2 deficient muscle when compared to control. This shows that ULK2 does not regulate the fusion of the lysosome to the autophagosome, and therefore autophagic flux was not impaired at this, process, at this step. To further understand what is occurring, in these muscles, we examine other markers related to lysosomal integrity and function, and also proteasomal function. The proteasome is a critical in degrading small proteins and peptides. In these assays, we saw nothing that would suggest activity or function is impaired in the OK2 deficient muscle. In fact, cathepsin B, which is uh, an important lysosomal protease, had an increase in total protein and activity seemingly to compensate for the accumulation of proteins in the OK2 deficient muscle. Since there were no obvious deficiencies in lysosomal proteosomal function, we examined further. Uh, we did this by taking the same muscles and same muscles that were electroporated and homogenized them with a mild detergent. This mild detergent does not denature the proteins, but it does facilitate soluble proteins to come into, into solution while the insoluble proteins, which are rich in, in aggregate proteins, do not. From there, we put the lysates through different centrifugation and separation techniques to separate out the supernatant, or soluble fraction, in the pellet, or insoluble fraction. We then proceeded, proceeded to put each aliquot into a more stringent detergent and heat them so that, they would, that the proteins would become denatured. 
From there, we ran the pellet and supernatant lysates in a Western blot and probe for P62, MBR1, and ubiquitin, which were those same proteins that were accumulating in the normal whole muscle lysates when in the OK2 deficient muscle. Uh, this showed very interesting results and in that there was robust accumulation of these proteins in the pellet lysate in the OK2 deficient muscle, while there was no accumulation in the supernatant lysate. This shows that UK2 plays a critical role in the degradation of ubiquinated aggregate proteins. It is important to know also that elevated levels of aggregate proteins are present in different neuromuscular condition, different neuromuscular conditions such as Huntington's disease and ALS, which further exacerbate the disease conditions when those aggregate proteins are present. Because of that, we hypothesized that since these muscles were deficient of yolk A2 for just one week, that if we, looked at, that if we took the experiment out to represent more of a chronic condition, like two or three weeks, we would see impairments in muscle force and myofiber integrity, as is seen in those neuromuscular dis diseases like Huntington's and ALS and other uh, myopathic conditions. To test this, we set up the same model as before, where we electroprated one TA of the mouse with a plasmid encoding for either mere micro, or either UOK2 or UOK1 microRNA in one leg and a plasmid encoding for a non-targeting microRNA in the other to surface control. The difference was that instead of harvesting at one week post electroporation, we would stimulate the muscle at one, two, and three weeks following the electroporation and harvest at four weeks post electroporation. To test the effects of that chronic UOK2 or UOK1 deficiency, uh, that the effect that those have on muscle function, we first anesthetized the, anesthetized the mouse and put them on a heat plate. Then we secure the knee between two pivots and secure the foot of the hind limb to the foot plate attached to a force transducer. We put two needle electrodes just underneath the skin and maximally stimulate the, the fibular nerve. Uh, Titanic isometric contractions at optimal length were elicited by stimulation of 150 hertz for 300 milliseconds using the 13A 3-in-1 whole animal system from Aurora Scientific. At one week, we see no difference in force production. However, at two and three weeks post-electroporation, we see a 25 to 30 percent reduction in force only in the UOK2 deficient muscle with no changes in UOK2, UOK1 deficient muscle. Next, we looked at TA mass and fiber diameter, and with UOK2 deficient muscle, we see a 10 to 12% reduction in both mass and fiber diameter. Although this is, is significant, the 10 to 12% reduction in mass and or diameter is not enough alone to drive the nearly 30% reduction in force production. Because of this, we hypothesized that the muscle was unhealthy or damaged. One way of examining this is by looking at the percent of centrally nucleated fibers in the electroporated muscle. Muscle fibers have satellite cells surrounding them, and once muscle is damaged, nuclei will migrate to the center of the fiber and aid in repair and regeneration. And this is a marker of damage in that specific fiber. Uh, when we looked at this, we saw through h &E staining, we see roughly a 20% increase in centrally nucleated fibers in UOK2 deficient muscle. Also, it wasn't uncommon to see generally unhealthy morphology in UOK2 deficient muscle as depicted in the image on the right. There are multiple pockets of muscle that had infiltrating, had infiltrating cells and, degre and degradation of muscle fibers themselves. None of this was observed, however, in the UOK1 deficient muscle. What we concluded from there is that these, uh, from these data is that UOK2 is required for maintenance of skeletal muscle force, mass, and myofiber integrity. In summary, our studies reveal that, UOK2, that the UOK2 gene presents a skeletal muscle enriched pattern of expression in mice and that its deficiency in skeletal muscle, despite not impairing, impairing autophagy flux and proteolytic activities of the lysosome and proteasome, leads to robust accumulation of insoluble ubiquinated protein aggregates associated with autophagy adapters P62 and MBR1. These findings suggest a key role for UOK2 in, in modulating the recognition and or sequestration of ubiquinated protein aggregates for degradation by autophagy and potentially by the proteasome. The ensuing inability of ULK2 deficient muscle to clear proteotoxic aggregates leads to atrophy, impaired force production, myofiber degeneration, and a generally unhealthy morphology of the muscle. Of note, these cellular events and functional outcomes are not observed in ULK1 deficient muscle. 
some conclusions that we made from these is that UOK2 is critical for skeletal muscle function and homeostasis to maintain force production. And this is regulated through ubiquinated protein degradation and prevention of the accumulation of aggregate proteins. UOK2 is essential for ubiquinated protein recognition and or sequestration for, pro, for proteolysis, but does not directly regulate autophagy itself. Targeting UOK2 may represent a potential therapy to aid in these adverse myopathic conditions. We are currently investigating the, pro, the precise role that UOK2 plays in skeletal muscle by studying other models where we manipulate the expression of UOK2 and examine how UOK2 regulates degradation of ubiquinated protein aggregates. I'd like to thank my fellow lab members, especially my mentor, Vitor Lira, our collaborators, and our funding sources. Thank you.